From this bird's eye view, that looks like a quarry. In fact, it's a natural feature. The cliff face on the eastern side of Mam Tor in the Peak District National Park, and this is the starting point of our study of the area. The Peak District is situated in North Derbyshire, between Manchester and Sheffield. Mam Tor itself is approximately midway between the two cities. It stands south of the famous plateau of Kinder Scout. Mam Tor is a mountain at the end of that splendid ridge walk that separates the Edale Valley over there to the left and the Hope Valley. Mam Tor. It's an odd sort of name, but it means rather what you'd think it sounds as though it means. The Mother Mountain. It's also known as the Shivering Mountain because it's made up of layers of sandstone on top of shale. And when the shale gets wet, the sandstone falls away, which means that on one side of Mam Tor, there's a continuously vertical cliff. And that means that with the steep descent into Edale on the other side, it was the ideal place for early Mam to build a fort which was almost completely impregnable. And indeed, Mam Tor is the site of one of the finest Iron Age forts in Britain. You can see the remains of the ancient ramparts clearly from the air. Look at the lines of grass-covered mounds. Now they're broken by paths like that one running through the middle. The footpath runs close to the precipitous edge of the vertical rock face on the east side of the fort. It's a popular footpath, and the foolhardy, like that boy, must take care as they approach the edge. If you don't take care, you could end up on those mounds down there. They've been produced by the falling rocks and debris from the exposed rock face. A short distance south of Mam Tor, the rock changes from sandstone and shales to Carboniferous Limestone. We're following the line of the Manchester Sheffield Road, which goes via Castleton. For many visitors to the Peak District, the Winnets Pass, just off the main road, will be familiar. But they're unlikely to have seen the pass from this angle. Here you have a clear idea of its extent. Although the pass is a physically small feature, it extends only 800 metres, and the height of the slopes is only 90 metres, in the rolling hills and dry valleys of this part of the Pennines, it's distinctive. We filmed these air views in the summer, when the air was clear and the vegetation fully grown. Earlier in the year, when we filmed from the ground, the scene looked rather different. The Winnets Pass is not only deep, dark and dramatic, it's dangerous too. For it's in the nature of the Carboniferous Limestone that the pass cuts through to be a heavily jointed rock, which means that fragments can detach themselves from the parent body and come tumbling down into the gorge. And it's not just small fragments either. It's boulders as big as this one. And if something like that landed on you, it wouldn't improve your appearance at all. There is plenty of speculation about how the Winnets Pass was formed. Some people say it was an underground cavern and the roof collapsed. Others say it was a river valley deepened by water rushing down from the glaciers during the Ice Age. But however it was formed, it's a spectacular piece of scenery indeed. The Carboniferous limestone through which it's carved is a very hard rock, but it is soluble in dilute acid, which is what rainwater is when it's fallen through the atmosphere. It falls on the surface of the rock and it runs down joints in the rock, widening those joints, forming caverns and caves. Caves here are much smaller than the honeycomb of caves on either side of the Winnets Pass. 
This is Tree Cliff Cavern, one of the caves discovered by miners searching for lead and who found Blue John as well. The mining in this area dates back to Roman times, but it wasn't until the 18th century that many of the cave systems were rediscovered. The caves in Tree Cliff in the Castleton Valley have been worked for hundreds of years, and the dark areas in the rock face here that you can see indicate what the miners were after. They were after Blue John, which is a beautiful purple-colored rock. It's a fluorite which was stained with petroleum. And you can see all the dark patches where they've worked. And you can also see a band of it in that arch there. It's called, after the fluor spa, it's called the Blue John Arch. And above me here, there's another band of it running along. You might be able to see it if I point out with a stick there and along there with its crystals, the purple staining. In the daylight, this is what the mineral looks like in its rough state. And this is what it looks like when it's polished. By careful extraction and polishing, this crude mineral can become transparent and as beautiful as this. For the geologist, the caves are as interesting for the fossils which stud the roof and walls as they are for the Blue John. These crinoids, remains of small seawater creatures, together with other fossils, indicate that the limestone was originally formed from sediments deposited by a sea which covered the whole of Britain. Indeed, Tree Cliff Hill represents a massive coral reef, similar to that which now exists off the east coast of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. The caverns also show the effects of water which has percolated through the cracks and crevices in the limestone. Rainwater, which contains some carbon dioxide absorbed from the air, is really carbonated water. When it's in contact with the limestone, it changes it to calcium bicarbonate, which is highly soluble. It dissolves easily. This water, with the dissolved limestone, drips continuously from the cave ceilings. Some of the dissolved material remains as the water evaporates, causing stalactites, which hang from the ceiling, and stalagmites, which are built up from the floor. Sometimes waterfalls of masses of stalactites are produced, they take thousands of years to grow by even a few centimeters. And here is another commercial interest in the limestone. Limestone is a basic ingredient in cement and is needed throughout Britain in vast quantities. This quarry, two and a half kilometers from Treat Cliff Cavern, produces nearly one and a half million tons of cement a year. Quarrying is slowly eating into Bradwell Moor overlooking Castleton. This quarry was here before the institution of the Peak District National Park. The company, however, have tried to develop the quarry so that it harmonizes with the landscape features of the area. Precautions are also taken to prevent dust emission, but you can hardly reduce the noise of the blast. So far, we've looked at the limestone features between Mam Tor and the quarry, and at the shales and sandstones which form Mam Tor itself. To the east of the quarry, there on the left, and midway between Castleton and Sheffield is Stanage Edge. Here we see a different type of rock. This is the millstone grit outcropping along Stanage Edge, one of several ridges running north to south in this area of the Pennines. The ridge tops form the summit of an escarpment. To the west are the steep rock faces, we're looking at them now, beyond to the east is a gentle dip slope.
The millstone grit is a younger rock than the Carboniferous Limestone. It's a sedimentary rock formed from sandy deposits laid down on the floor of an ancient sea. The millstone grit formed a layer above the layers of the limestone. Because of the nature of the rock, it's very hard, tends not to be slippery as limestone is when it's wet, and it's well jointed, it's an ideal training ground for climbers. The same features which make millstone grit suitable for rock climbers have made the rock commercially valuable. The very words millstone grit tell you what the use is likely to be. Millstones from here were used in the sharpening of steel blades. The dip slopes running eastwards towards Sheffield, just 12 kilometers away, carry the streams which provided water power necessary for industries in the past in Sheffield. Abbeydale, in the southern suburbs of Sheffield, illustrates this clearly. Abbeydale is an industrial hamlet in the Sheaf Valley. At the end of the reservoir, you can see the main buildings. It is now a museum of industrial archaeology owned by Sheffield Corporation and opened in 1970 after extensive renovation. Until 1933, this was a compact industrial unit producing scythes, hay knives and other agricultural blades. It also housed the craftsman and the factory owner. In deciding where this factory was to be sited, the availability of regular supplies of water was critical, for water provided the energy to drive the massive water wheels, which, in turn, drove the machinery, which can still be seen in working order. Water power drives the wheels which lift these massive hammers. And water also drives the machinery which pumps these enormous bellows, providing the draft for the forge. At Abbeydale, the craftsmen produce small quantities of blades using massive machinery and much skill. Factories in Sheffield today use more sophisticated machinery and production is on a much larger scale. As in Abbeydale, however, individual skill is still essential.
workshops producing implements like these are a distinctive feature of the Sheffield industrial scene and contrast with the mammoth steelworks and engineering firms of the Don Valley. Just look at this industrial landscape. Water supply, road, canal and later rail links, availability of coal, plus the movement of people into the city, these are some of the factors which account for this concentration of industry. To house the increasing population, Sheffield has spread outward into suburbs and more recently, near the centre, new multi-storey blocks of flats have been built. Today, Sheffield's population stands at 561,500 and the city centre has received a modern facelift. While the new city centre attracts visitors into the city, so also many residents are attracted out of the city for their leisure, especially to the nearby Peak District. Castleton is only 21 kilometres away and is easily reached by car. It's a good centre for exploring on foot the Hope Valley and the Winnets. Hotels and a youth hostel provide accommodation. Despite the many visitors, the village retains its distinctive character. Peveril Castle crowns a lofty hill and gives the town its name. From Castleton, we can see the chimney of the nearby cement factory, a reminder of the conflict which occurs in national parks where there are valuable rocks and minerals. Limestone produces underground scenery like the caves and also surface scenery like the Winnets Pass. These attract many visitors, especially from the cities on both sides of the Pennines. The visitors can be as much of a threat as mining and quarrying can be to the beauties of the park. 